So high performance graphics in Android. You've been hearing today, I'm Richard Hyman. Uh, high performance graphics in Android. You've been hearing today about uh, UIs and experiences in Android. And we all know, Android developers in the room, how to use list views, gallery views, web views, all these things that the uh, Android core team work on day in, day out to make sure that they support hardware acceleration for you. But what if you don't want to use grid views, gallery views, list views? What if you want to go off-piste? What if you want to control all the pixels on the screen yourself? Well, today we're going to talk about high-performance graphics, but because we charge for our time and we want to be efficient, we're going to talk about minimal effort with high-performance graphics. There are many different ways of doing high-performance graphics in Android, different frameworks, different layers, we give you responsiveness and blank slides. But <laughs> here I've painted the entire canvas white because that's quite efficient. There we go. So we have the canvas. Canvas is the easiest way to get pixels onto the screen in Android. We have OpenGL. You can access OpenGL through, uh, through Dalvik through the NDK, or through RenderScript. Different ways of getting to the same thing. And we'll talk about why those things are different and how it affects your application. We have RenderScript. New to Android, running on Honeycomb and above. And then the NDK. So when you're thinking about doing your applications and you see all of these different options, for getting pixels to the screen and moving things around. They use different amounts of memory. You need to provide different amounts of glue for each one of these. Which one should you be using? So the NDK, or the Native Development Kit, provides streamlined access to OpenGL. If you're using the NDK, you can access all the OpenGL APIs directly, but at the same time, you can use the optimized features on the CPUs and GPUs, the neon and the, the vector and the floating point units. If you're thinking about porting games from other platforms to Android or vice versa or writing cross-platform games, developers often choose the NDK. The native window in the NDK uh, is the fastest way of getting pixels to the screen in Android. It's the direct pixel buffer on the GPU that you can get access to. And this combination using NDK, OpenGL, and native window will provide you the highest performance in your Android application. An example of an Android application that uses this is Google Earth. So when you're using the NDK, you're writing code for ARM chips. You're writing C, C++ code. You're compiling it up, and then your application is limited to the devices that have that chipset. So in this case, Google Earth works on ARM7 devices. But what you get is a very immersive experience with very fast graphics, access to all the graphics memory. But, as I was saying, all these different APIs, which one is the best for you and the best for your application? So whether you access OpenGL through Dalvik, RenderScript, or the NDK, it gives you the ability to create the highest performance applications. The difference being, if you use a canvas and you're using OpenGL, every single call you make to OpenGL has got to go through the native layer and back up again. If you use RenderScript, you're closer to that native layer. And if you use the NDK, you're there, and everything is instant. OpenGL is closest to the GPU hardware, the fastest performance. You have to understand the hardware and the Android devices that have different GPUs. And it can be used on 2D games. The different GPUs thing, I mean, if you're looking at supporting the Snapdragon GPUs and the, the Qualcomm, the NVIDIA GPUs, these devices are using different uh, texture compression formats. They have slightly different function sets. So using multiple APK, if the only one of the functions that you're using that's different is the, the texture compression formats, you can use Android Market's multiple APK feature to create the same application and have your graphics compressed in two different texture formats 
And then the users don't have to download both sets of graphics, could be 30, 40 megabytes. And the, the Android market will just deliver the correct APK file to the correct user. But as it says, as a developer, you have to understand what you're getting into when you're using OpenGL. An example of an application that uses OpenGL from the Java layer is Google Body. So something here that's created, this application doesn't have the limitation that it will only run on ARM7 devices. Because it's using the OpenGL layer through Dalvik, and they're not using the NDK, there's no natively compiled code. You have cross-platform, or cross all the Android portability. If you're looking at OpenGL, there's a couple of standards. OpenGL ES, OpenGL, uh, OpenGL 2 is running now on 91% of Android devices that are out in the market. So you want to use OpenGL, or you want to use fast rendering, but you want to use pointers. You're a hardcore techie, and you want some fancy graphics. Well, we can take a look at RenderScript, and RenderScript is a glimpse into the future of Android in the way that it's a high-performance subsystem that gives you direct access to the GPU and to the CPU and to neon vector floating points, but through an easily accessible layer without having to do all the NDK glue. I'll give you an example of RenderScript in a minute, but I'll show you an example now. So these applications, the, uh, the hero screen in the music app, is done using RenderScript. The YouTube app's homepage on Honeycomb Tablets is done using RenderScript. And these are great use cases for RenderScript, where, as you'll see in a minute, you just include a script file inside your APK, and you can render these things. There's no mucking about with native compilation. No OpenGL required. Although, you can use OpenGL and RenderScript together, with the advantage that RenderScript and OpenGL is faster than Canvas and OpenGL. Because, as I said before, if you're using a Canvas and OpenGL, every single OpenGL command goes through the native layer and back up again. With RenderScript, you get a script that you've written, it gets deployed in the APK file, and it's compiled at runtime on the device into native code. So you don't need to worry about compiling your, your native code and packaging it up and limiting your application. RenderScript has got a very specifically selected set of APIs in it, which we guarantee will work across all of the Android platforms. And these APIs can be compiled on the device at runtime, and that compilation takes account of CPU features and GPU features for you. This makes it very flexible. Of course, debugging is uh, slightly trickier. As soon as you move operations into the GPU hardware, Debugging is slightly more difficult. You do have tools from the GPU manufacturers which can help with that. An OpenGL with NDK, as I say, it's that, it's that platform of choice for those game developers that are writing games across all the different platforms, the high performance games. You can write your core engine once and your rendering once, and then just attach it with some glue to the Java layer above. Maybe do some of the menu systems in Dalvik or in Java using Android. Um, so, which one is suited best to your application? Canvas, native window, OpenGL, render script. We're going to have to have a look at a couple of examples to see how these things all fit together. It's actually interesting to point out that a lot of the Android framework in Gingerbread and below is done on the canvas, and it's not hardware accelerated. And if you're going to use this canvas with all its operations, and it is one of the most feature-rich ways of pushing graphics to the, the screen in Android, it's got a texture rendering, bitmap drawing, scaling, rotation, skews, all these kind of things you can just do on any of the graphics you're pushing to the canvas. Then think about how to make that high performance because it isn't taken care of for you. You've got to think all the time you're drawing the smallest number of pixels. Think about your clip rectangles. Think when you invalidate the screen, don't invalidate the whole thing. Don't try and redraw the entire view. It's the easiest API to use, 
but you have to think, be slightly more performant when you're using it. And try, if possible, to draw each pixel only once. Don't layer everything on top of each other as you're drawing. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes it is. So general guidelines, invalidate only the change regions. If you have background threads running, which is great, we advocate this across the whole of Android, even when you're using list views, don't do any processing in the foreground. Do your processing in the background on a background thread. Leave the UI thread for the UI. The same goes when you're doing graphics. And it's just as important that if you are running a background thread, you tell the system to give it background priority. You tell the system to let the canvas which is more resource intensive, have as much of the resources as possible. And use shallow view hierarchies. In the Android tools, there's a couple of tools. One's called Hierarchy Viewer, and the other one's Layout Optimizer. You can use these tools to have a look through your hierarchies live on the device, find out how long the layouts and rendering for each one of the views is taking, and then optimize those views based on the feedback from Hierarchy Viewer. Especially important, again, in list views or grid views where your views are getting reused over and over again. If you, even a few milliseconds update uh, optimization on a list view as you're scrolling, if each one of those views is a few milliseconds faster, you're going to notice as you scroll through thousands of views. Layers, we're going to talk about a little bit later, but complex drawing can be cached especially if you want to then animate that complex drawing or put, add filters to it. And then rescaling images yourself helps. Instead of just telling to put them to the screen at a certain size, rescale them first, cache that image, and put it to the screen. Like this. OK, so those examples. Let's switch. We've got three examples coming up. The first one is going to be a canvas. The second one, OpenGL. And the third one, render script. So I'm just going to switch over to my tablet quickly. It's going to work. Hey. OK, so this is simple canvas drawing. I'm going to show you the code for this in a minute. This thing here. There's like 10 lines of code. You're just drawing the screen white. Then we put the screen image, the, um, the clock image on the screen. We rotate the canvas, put one of the hands on, rotate it again, put the other hand on, and rotate it back again. It's the simplest way of getting graphics onto Android. It can be quite effective. And on here, we're updating kind of 60 to 100 frames a second. Very, very simple drawing. Custom control, very easy to do. The second one is a basic GL surface. And I've included this as an example just to show you, when we look at the code in a second, that the, the setup of OpenGL can be pretty daunting. If you have a look at anyone's OpenGL code, there's always a chunk of setup at the start, which sets up the lights and the textures and the matrix, all these kind of things. But once you've got past that, then your OpenGL experience uh, is pretty fine-tunable as you move the cameras around and change the lights. And the third one is render script. So this render script fountain, you just, uh, oh. so every time I put my finger on the screen, it's going to start drawing dots. And I can use 10 fingers and draw dots all over the screen. And the important thing about this is this entire canvas is rendered in render script. The touch events are captured on the Java layer. You can put the, the light back on, thank you. The touch events for this canvas are captured on the Java layer, and they're passed down to the render script canvas which then does, it's all done natively from that point onwards. So you can get some awesome frame rates. And, um, ah, switch back to the laptop. Because you can't see what I can see. Okay. So if we have a quick look at the code for these. So the first one was the stopwatch view. It was a canvas. It's based on the Lunar Lander example. Pretty simple, comes in the Android SDK. You can find it for yourself. Canvas views give you uh, an on-draw method. So here, inside my canvas, I've got a run method. And whilst I'm running, I do this, which is to lock the canvas, update the physics of the clock. This is that stopwatch we saw running a minute ago. 
and then draw the clock. So this is the, the main run function of that canvas operation. So if we have a look down, uh, the lot of the canvas, by the way, here, is double buffering for us. So you don't need to, to improve performance, you don't need to draw to an off-screen bitmap and put it back onto the screen again. If you use lock canvas, and then unlock canvas and post, the, uh, the framework takes care of double buffering it for you. So we can have a look down. Update physics just figures out the time that it should display right now and the angle of the hands. And then that's just followed by the draw loop, which draws the whole thing white, draws the clock bitmap, rotates the canvas and draws the second hand, then rotates the canvas again, draws the minute hand and restores it. So that whole clock widget is just done in these three methods here. But then if you go and have a look at the fountain, which isn't open. OK. So the fountain activity. This was the, the render script one. All right, we've jumped ahead. Where's the, the basic GL surface view? Let's grab this one. So a very, very basic OpenGL application, just rotating one, uh, one triangle. We start with our activity. And the whole of the activity, we've got an on pause and on resume, but the whole activity is just the on create. And on create is creating a basic GL surface view, which is one of these. The basic GL surface view sets us to use OpenGL version 2, and then sets the renderer to be this. And it's here that we're saying now that we're on a GL surface view. So we've gone from a surface view for the, the clock to a GL surface view now for this. And the triangle renderer, as I said before, has this set up. Where's the init method? Is that one? OK, this is the initialization of the OpenGL environment. And these things always look daunting, but pretty much you can copy and paste some of this stuff across. You get your textures. And there's the bitmap there that we're going to add as a texture here onto our matrix. This stuff, I don't know, always looks a little bit over the top, to be honest, to draw a single triangle. But it becomes a lot easier when you start loading models up and loading textures up and applying these kind of things and then using them inside your game. And the third example was the render script. So the render script, again, we have an activity with an onCreate. The onResume and onPause are both pretty much empty. The onCreate just creates the fountain view and sets it onto our content. The fountain view is an RS surface view. So we've gone from a surface view to a GL, uh, OpenGL surface view to an, a render script surface view. <coughs> Similarly, we have a small amount of setup if this surface changes. We get the renderer. But then the only other thing this surface view does is capture touch events, which is what I was saying before. We, the only other method is the onTouch event method. And the onTouch event method is just sending the touch positions as they move, or as they're, they're put down, through to the render script. And the glue that we were talking about before is in the final class, the fountain RS. This class provides the glue in between Android, excuse me, Android and render script. So every time here, you want to do the init. Every time a touch event comes in here, this is the glue that's required to pass that touch event down onto the render script layer. And it's this one here, mscript.invokeAddParticles, and the rate and things. And it's this method here that's implemented inside render script, which is here. The fountain.rs file is a script file that's just sat in amongst our package in the, the Java environment. This is what makes RenderScript so beautiful. It just sits there. You don't have to native compile it. It is a script. gets compiled later on on the device. The setup method, and then the add particles method. So there we go. This is the method that gets run. When I touch the screen, the touch event goes through to the RenderScript surface view. That passes it through the glue down into here. It decides whether it wants a new color on the Java layer. And then here, whilst it's falling down the screen, it just figures out how it should fall geometry-wise down the screen. So that, it's available inside the, uh, the SDK. It's the simplest render script example that we have. 
uh, and you can see it's just give the whole screen over to RenderScript, use whatever Java functions you're normally using, the onTouch event, and pass those off to RenderScript to get processed. And RenderScript will render them natively on that screen as fast as it can. If you want to get scared, you can have a look at the carousel example. This is the carousel that comes in the music player activity. This is also open sourced. That example's not quite so, uh, so simple. I had a look at it. I was going to try and use it during this talk. And the carousel example is here. And it's got, again, it looks very, very simple to the uh, very sync. Looks very the same as the previous example, similar to the previous example. But when you have a look in the carousel render script file, it's insane. I don't know who wrote this and how they debugged it. But it, um, I know it looks good when it's spinning through all of those items. And it's scalable. You don't have to just use it with music. You can use it with your own graphics and all these things. And it can loop around and do some clever, clever stuff. Computing ray plane intersections. Nice. That's a very useful function. Ray cylinder intersections. I don't know if all this stuff is even used. But oh my god, it goes on. There you go. So someone managed to debug and write that inside Google and put it inside the music app for that awesome hero screen that you see uh, for the recently added tracks. But it's all there, and it is open sourced as part of the Android UI uh, utilities. You can find that online. So let's have a look back at the presentation. OK. So we've been through the render script example. And the point of those examples is to hopefully to help give you some idea of which one you're going to use when you're making your own applications. Whether you can get away with just using a canvas, whether you want to use RenderScript and C99, or whether you want to go all the way into using the NDK, cross-platform portability, all those kind of options. So the UI on Gingerbread and Below is a software UI. On Honeycomb and above, it's a hardware accelerated UI. And you may wonder, why on earth would you do that now? We've got processors that are running 1.4 gigahertz dual cores. We've got uh, yeah, multiple cores, higher clock speeds. Why all of a sudden do we need to accelerate the UI? Well, you've got to think, first of all, we want that awesome uh, swishy experience. We want it very, very responsive. <laughs> we want all these lovely pixels. And it's those pixels that are the problem. The increase in the display densities and the number of pixels on the screen is outstripping the increase in memory speeds. And it's that memory copy from the graphics buffer back onto the screen again that you can't get from software, especially when you're looking at an image that's 1,280 by 800 pixels. So without moving all this onto the hardware, you get a bit stuck. So here you can see, as the, the devices went around, the G1 had a mem copy speed of whatever, 250. Uh, and the pixel count was quite low. But as it goes across to the zoom, the pixel count has outstripped the memory copy speed. So we have to move it into hardware. The software rendering pipeline looked a lot like this. You had your on draw, which made the canvas draw, went to a software rasterizer, which went to the display. Now we have this. The canvas draw goes to the GL renderer, which goes onto the GPU. That provides a lot of benefits for us. You can imagine when you're trying to draw a list view, at the very top and bottom, you've got those little fade outs. These are all the triangles that are getting rendered. Same with a button view or a path on the screen. All these things now can be done in hardware just by setting hardware accelerated equals true. You can set it at many different levels. You can set hardware accelerated for your entire application. You can set it for your activity, your window, or just a view. And there's reasons why you would want to do that. Because hardware acceleration doesn't support all the features. So here we go. This is adding hardware acceleration into the application and at the activity level. You can say one activity doesn't support hardware acceleration and turn it off. And then you can do it at the window level inside your code. And you can check whether or not your view is hardware accelerated or not. So again, because of the 2D API and what GL can do, not everything works. And here's a list of things that don't work at all. These are totally unsupported operations if you turn hardware acceleration on. 
So if your canvas is currently doing any of these things, you turn hardware acceleration on, you're going to start failing on these items. The same with the paint. And this is just because they're not supported operations on a GPU right now. Limitations? Draw lines doesn't have anti-aliasing on a canvas. All these, again, available on the developer website. They're all open. We'd much prefer you are using hardware acceleration, and if you come across any of these problems, you work around them. Which leads us to the new drawing model. So it just changes the way rendering works entirely. So here we go, the old drawing model. Your view root, this is when you're making your layouts in XML. You've got your view root, your view groups, linear layouts, relative layouts, and then inside those you've got the views. Previously, if you invalidated a view, say, as a specific example, if you had a, a text box and an image view, and they were both inside a linear layout, if you invalidate the text box and say it needs redrawing, it will say that the view group also is then invalidated. And invalidating the view group causes the whole thing to get redrawn again. Suddenly your entire view is invalid just to redraw that one element. Comes down, redraws the group, redraws the views. Now, that's clearly a problem. That's not particularly efficient. We're redrawing far too many things. We're redrawing things that haven't changed on screen. So display lists are a new solution to that. Instead of redrawing everything, once they're, whilst they're being drawn, we're now caching the sequence of draw methods that are required to draw an item. So here, to draw a button, you have put a button in your XML file saying that you want a button on screen. When it comes to actually drawing that button, we store this display list. It's cached. And it says we need to draw the patch, clip rect, translate, draw text on the button, restore, and restore to count zero. And that now becomes the cache set of operations for drawing this button. It doesn't require a new layout. It doesn't require measuring again. It's all done. And this is now being cached if you're using hardware acceleration on Android. So what this means is when, just to explain, this is your views, and these are the things now in the display list that are being cached on the right-hand side. You invalidate your view. We can now say that the, view, the display list that we cached for that one view is now wrong. So now when we invalidate, this isn't invalid. The view group's not invalid. All we have to say is, rebuild over there, and it's just going to have to rebuild that one display list for that one button. And the whole rest of the view can render very, very quickly. It's just going to run through the display list. It knows all the operations it needs to do to render your entire display to screen. And then it rebuilds display list B, and you have your, uh, your final view again. And here, oh, so as a, an actual example, I take my finger inside the settings and I click on the Wi-Fi button here and it goes grayed out. Previously, we'd have to run through these things. Background draw, panel draw, selector draw, Wi-Fi draw, turn on Wi-Fi, all these different things, drawing all these different elements of that one view group, which was that settings view group. Now, we draw the selector and we draw the display lists. Everything else happens transparently and very fast. There's some caveats with this, of course. Because previously you may have invalidated a view, and other views that it touched would automatically, sibling views, parent views, and child views, would have been invalidated and redrawn as well. <coughs> so now with the new model, you have to invalidate the views that you want to redraw. So you may see if you turn hardware acceleration on, you get some glitches, some things aren't redrawing. And that's because previously you were assuming that they would redraw by invalidating a, a sibling or a child view. And now you have to be specific about which views you want to redraw. And that's going to be the main hurdle when you turn a hardware acceleration on, just making sure you're telling it to invalidate the right set of views. And that's going to give you a much more performant user interface as soon as you get that hardware acceleration turned on. So, hmm. 
Invalidating a view group previously meant that both children would have to be redrawn. This doesn't just apply to the views, it applies to the entire view groups as well. So it would redraw both children. So that settings bar example we were talking about. Now, with the display list model, you can invalidate the view group. It marks the display list as dirty, invalidates itself, redraw. It just rebuilds the display list, but it already knows how to do everything, all the different children of that display list, because we have display list A and display list B for the view A and view B are already cached. So again, it just needs to rebuild and relay out that top section and all the children inside it happen automatically. So this works on every single level of the view hierarchy. I just said that. Okay, so I was talking about layers a little bit before. Layers on Android, again, a relatively new concept, and you can apply them by doing view.setLayerType. So imagine when you're drawing a display list, or anything, you don't want to just draw it to the screen. If you draw it to a layer and then draw it to the screen, you have a lot of power over it. You can apply functions to it, filters to it, anything you want to the layer that's pre-rendered before it goes to the screen. So we've now built this um, capability into Android that when you're rendering, you can render your views and view groups to layers first. And here, we've got three layer types. Layer type none gives you the de default drawing mechanism that you had before. It's just going to render your view directly to the screen. Layer type software is going to render your view to an off-screen bitmap in the heap memory of your application. And layer type hardware is going to render it to a hardware layer before putting it to the screen. That's using the GPU memory to render your view directly into the GPU memory before you do something with it, like animate it, for example. So you've got to think, if you're going to create a complex view and you're going to want to animate that complex view, whether you're going to want to spin it round or move it up and down, whatever it is, the worst case is you don't put a layer in place. It's going to draw your entire view to the screen and every single frame it's going to draw your entire view to the screen as it's animating across the screen. If you choose the software layer, it's going to render it into an off-screen bitmap in software and move those pixels into the display buffer. And then it can use, again, just by moving that bitmap around, it's going to be a lot faster. And if you use the hardware layer, it's going to render your entire complex view into the graphics memory of the GPU. And as you animate it around, it can get it onto the screen in almost zero time. You can change having a complex view from rendering it whatever, one or two frames a second, to being animated at 100 frames a second, just by changing the layer type that you're using for your views. So here, if you have a list view that you're going to be playing around with, software rendering 10 milliseconds, the benefits we've managed to add with display lists and being able to re-render quickly makes that down to 2 milliseconds. But if you put it in a hardware layer, it's instant. That's in milliseconds, 0 0.009 milliseconds. That's just direct graphics memory copying onto the screen. And you get the benefit with hardware and software layers, you can apply effects as well. Here, we've got the launcher screen from Honeycomb. It's rendered to a hardware layer. And with that, we can apply a paint to it. We can say, we just want to desaturate this layer before putting it to the screen. And we don't have to desaturate all the items. We don't have to apply a filter to it. We can just say here, Set saturation zero, set layer type hardware on our page, and apply this paint. And it's going to apply that to the entire layer. And you can use the paint functions that exist, and the animation functions that exist, to alter your, your entire layer at a time, without having to worry about all the individual views. You've got a rendered item that you can play with. And that rendered item, again, can be in hardware or software. Maximum compatibility is through software layers. It's always going to be. Uh, you'll get different amounts of GPU memory, different things if you're trying to render massive bitmaps onto the hardware layers. You may come across some, some issues. With software layers, at least there's going to be more consistency for you. You don't need to worry about the, the OpenGL pipelines, things like that, running out of buffers. 
Again, animations can be done on hardware or software layers. So all these things can be done on a layer. You can render any view as complex as you want to a hardware or software layer and do all these different things. You can rotate, pivot, scale, translate, change the alpha. Changing the alpha is really important. Previously, alpha, without a layer, used to double the fill rate, used to half your frame rate of your application. Now with hardware layers, it takes no time. It's just done on the GPU. And all of these are not only layer friendly, they're display list friendly as well. So what does that mean? If you're thinking back to the display lists we had earlier when you're rendering uh, views onto screen, and you think, maybe I want to rotate one of the items. So here we go. We've got our view group with a view A and a view B in it. But you want to rotate view B. You want to set the rotation of view B after it's been uh, rendered to rotate by 45 degrees. All we have to do now, sorry, this is previous. There we go. All we have to do now, this was the display list that we had saved. We now say view B, we want to rotate by 45 degrees. We can insert that directly into the display list. We don't need to worry about, again, remeasuring, relaying out, doing anything else. We can just add in here, rotate 45 degrees before drawing layer B, and then restore again. By adding the display list functionality and the layers functionality into the Android framework, we've been able to optimize all the things you saw previously to work with all the views. And again, this is the one I've been banging on about. When you want to animate a complex view, before you do it, you can just set the hardware type, the layer type to hardware, do your animation. It's going to run in GPU memory. You're going to get amazing frame rates. It's going to take a ton of GPU memory. So once you're finished, set the layer type back to none again. So you want to make an awesome animation, set the layer type to hardware. It will render your entire complex view onto the GPU. It will do the rotation. And as soon as it's finished, set the layer type back to none again. You haven't leaked. You've got the same amount of memory available afterwards. But you've just run an animation of a very complex view at 100 frames a second. That's awesome. So hardware rendering tips. Uh, be careful of set alpha. Again, I mentioned, without hardware layers, it costs two times the fill rate. Use hardware layers, boom. Reuse rendering objects where you can. Construct them at the top, cache them, that kind of thing. Don't modify bitmaps when you don't need to, and don't modify the paths. These things are recommended now because you've seen the way display lists work and the way that invalidation works. If you stick with these methods, we can use those display lists and those layers to optimize your application for you and keep it running very, very high performance. If you go changing these things, the textures and the cached uh, paths, then we have to invalidate and redraw. And that, in a hopefully short enough amount of time, was high performance graphics for Android. Thank you very much. I hope I got some of it across. If anybody has any questions, now would be a hello. Good time to put your hand up. Uh, my question is, uh, of course, uh, the, we, we don't want to wait for the 3.0, and we want to do some acceleration on, on a 3 point something. And so we have a lot of code, which is already based on Compass. Is it, is it like, uh, would it be possible to have a wrapper around Compass, which would use, for example, RenderScape, so that I don't need to modify Would it be possible to wrap a canvas in RenderScript? The, the problem with that is that Canvas supports a lot of operations that RenderScript doesn't. So you'd have to write the functions in RenderScript to support skewing and all the different things that Canvas does, or at least the Canvas functions that you'd written. It's not something that I've uh, seen anyone mention before. It's an interesting proposition for kind of auto-accelerating applications, but writing that set of functions just basically support the entire Canvas set in RenderScript. Um. I guess even functions from the Sure. No, I, I get what you mean. I haven't, haven't heard of that before, or anyone trying to do it. I think it would be quite a large effort. It's probably easier to port to RenderScript, to be honest, the, the Canvas functions that you've got. But.
Thank you. If no one else has got their hand up, why not? Interesting. Again. <laughs> How do you cope with that? Maybe these devices are using software GL rendering if they don't have a GPU. So you need to, if it's possible. I wonder what device information you can pull out to decide whether or not you've got a GPU. You just use canvas.ishardwareaccelerated. This is the only function you need, actually. You can just ask if it's hardware accelerated or not. And if it's not, you're going to know that the OpenGL is software accelerated and then or software driven. Uh huh. I have to decide whether I have to use it or use a normal compass, and it will claim it maybe five times slower. So I guess there is some, some layer. Uh, I mean, uh, the OpenGL goes to CPU anyway. Mm -hmm. Because of the layer, it gets even slower. Sure. I can only guess that the same people that are pointing this out haven't got a solution for it already. So it's probably not open in the API docs, because at the time, we hadn't developed the new functionality. So we didn't have the API to find out if the new functionality we don't exist yet was implemented, which is tricky. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> But if you want to talk afterwards, I can check. OK. Has anybody else got a question? Hi, Thomas. Yeah. Not at all. At the moment, widgets are remote views, and remote views are very limited. You can't have a web view in there, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's just the. So, can I reuse somehow GPU to create a bitmap and send this bitmap to widgets? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's possible. So I, can, I can prepare the bitmap, uh, to accelerately draw there something complex, and then this bitmap sent to the. Hmm. Okay, so <laughs> you can generate the bitmap. Yeah, it, on a software layer or do something like that, but then you have to render it to a, something like an image view before you send it off to the widget. Mm -hmm. So in which case you're going to lose most of the performance. You certainly can't render it on the GPU or on the, the software layer and then blit it onto the widget itself because the widget, as I say, it's a remote view, so you can only send it commands and views and, and layouts. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure um, which part of your widget needs performance improving, but is it the actual, the initial rendering, or does it do something clever afterwards? Uh, you know, I found that, for example, paths or, or, or circles. And, and so okay. Yeah. So it is doing the rendering yes. on a canvas and creating a bitmap and sending that, but it's doing that rendering that's, um, that's slowing you down. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we see a lot with widgets, the, the pre-caching and pre-rendering. And once you've done it once, save it to a bitmap locally and just load it again later on. Anything that's taking a lot of time to render, especially if it's things like circles, and save them out and just use them again later. Anybody else? May I ask, uh, oh? so the only benefit uh, for, I, I get from uh, using a uh, render script um, instead of uh, writing in plain C++, mm -hmm. So you it to be compiled for me on runtime. Yeah. The main benefit, yeah, is that it's going to be compiled on runtime for you. Is it the only benefit, or there any the benefit? other one is the glue. It's a lot easier to do the render script gluing into Java than it is for the NDK, but not a lot easier. But it is easier. It should be easier than using JNI. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. But if you're used to using JNI anyway, then feel free to do it in a in native. A lot of people find that a bit scary. Sorry, actually, on, on that point again, the API levels that are supported are different for both technologies as well. So if you're using the NDK, you're restricting yourself to a device that's like ARM7. If you're using RenderScript, you are API, whatever, a honeycomb and above. Okay. So 
render script isn't a great thing if you want to support a lot of phones right now because it doesn't work on phones. Sorry. Uh, is there some significant overhead coming from the acceleration when you are switching the application and you have to like upload and download all the textures to the graphic card and back, which you haven't had to do before? When you're switching... The applications, like using the acceleration. I get you. Okay, so for accelerated applications... Uh, does it take a lot of time to get them back into memory again? More time because you need to get the textures up and down? Yeah, you do see that, definitely. Especially where you have applications that are taking a lot of textures. They can go into a paused state, hopefully maintain that graphics memory. But if they lose it, it can definitely take um, some amount of time to get those restored onto the GPU. But th there's nothing you can do about that, right? I mean, it's always going to take that amount of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right.